Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta, and in Butte, Montana, or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. You know, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor's support. They make all of this happen and provide us the ability to bring you each episode. It costs money to bring you these shows, and uh, their support is really important to make sure that happens. With that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. And we also want to thank Two Million Blossoms, the sponsor of this episode. Two Million Blossoms is a quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinators. Learn more on our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor Kirsten Trainer, and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with a number two. And also check out Kirsten's new Two Million Blossoms, the podcast, available on her website and from wherever you download and stream your podcast. Hey, Kim, how are you doing? It's uh, spring has sprung. No more snow, right? Spring has sprung. There's no more snow. It's been in the 80s for, I don't know, the last... 190 days. It's just been. <laughs> you sound like a farmer now. <laughs> <laughs> it's been really hot and really wet, and it's really green, and there's a lot of things blooming right now. Oh, great. And I'm hoping that the bees are getting to visit them because I've got I've got four trees in bloom in my yard, and three in the yard next to me, and there's enough honey out there. I I just hope they're able to take advantage of it. Yeah. Are you seeing any? Are they gathering any? Are they collecting any? Have I look, collected any honey? Yes. No, not yet. Yeah. No, not yet. I see. I can see. Um, well, we have, of course, in many of the same ways. We have a lot of blooms in blossom, and and the blackberries are in bloom in some parts of the region. Uh, not around me locally, but I think within flying distance of the bees. And I'm starting to, you know, I'm monitoring my hives on on using those broodminder sensors and the scale, and I can see the weight starting to creep up a little bit each day. So it's really, if you put it on a like a three-day or seven-day view, you can start seeing it starting to head up more than it's heading down. So it's really... Good. Yeah, it, it's really kind of the fun thing to do with that geeky stuff. I, lo- I love June. June's a good good month. Speaking of honey and making honey, you know, last August... We had with us uh, on the show Sarah Weiner and Mark Carlson from the Good Foods Award people, and I believe they are starting their honey competition. Yeah, we got we got them ahead of schedule this year. Instead of uh, after the show was over yeah. last year, when we talked to them, the show was over, and they told us about what had happened. This year, we got them to send us some information before the show started, so people could go look and find the directions and. And uh, get their honey ready. Yeah, we actually remembered this year. And with the help of the good the people there at the Good Food Awards, they sent us an audio postcard. Let's listen to it now. Okay. Hi there. This is Jessica from the Good Food Foundation. Entry period for the 12th annual Good Food Awards is open now through June 30th. And we're accepting entries from 18 different categories of food and drink, including honey. The Good Food Awards honors American artisans crafting exceptionally tasty and responsibly produced food and drink. Entries are $78 a piece to help cover logistics, and entrants can add on the option to receive judge feedback from the blind tasting in August for $15. Head over to goodfoodfdn.org for all the details and use code beekeeping at checkout for $10 off. Again, that's goodfoodfdn.org. F as in flower, D as in delicious, N as in nectar, dot org, code beekeeping at checkout for $10 off. 
We look forward to seeing your entries soon. So if you want more information about the Good Food Awards and how you can uh, sign up and submit honey for your competition, we'll have all those details or many of those details and the links in the show notes. And you can check it out and uh, submit your honey. If you do, let us know. We'd love to know that uh, one of our listeners won. Okay, now I'm going to have to harvest some honey. <laughs> you convinced me. <laughs> all right. So a couple other announcements. Um, transcripts uh, for our listeners. We, we started this month. Uh, in in the month of June and last latter part of May, starting added uh, transcriptions to our podcast, so you can hear every valuable word we utter on this show, and and we want to know if they're useful for you. Yeah, they they what transcripts do for me, Jeff, is I listen if I'm listening to a podcast and the, the recording went weird or people were talking at the same time or whatever, and, and you miss some, some of the content, you can go back to the transcript and pick up what you missed. Um, and if you read it, if, if it's a complicated subject, you get to read it a couple of times, it's going to clear things up for you. So you either get to hear what you missed or clarify what you heard. And, and uh, that makes the information more valuable. Of course, if, you're, if you have a hearing issue, like I do without my hearing aids, um, it, it makes life simple too. Oh, fantastic! So let us know uh, in the comments and or the the voice voicemail chats that you can leave. Let us know if you find the transcripts of use. Um, that's another thing that uh, our sponsors' dollars go towards uh, providing. A couple of weeks ago, we we ran a a, a hidden mug. A contest in our show at the very tail end. And and we said there was one mug available. It turned out that uh, Kim was hiding a couple other mugs in his closet. So we dug those out and we sent those out. We sent out a total of what, Kim, nine mugs, I believe. I believe that's correct. Yeah. About, I think almost all of them made it. Yeah. Well, we, yeah, there's two were broken in transit, we hear. Um, doggone it. Um, but there there's mugs out there in the wild. Those of you that received mug and you know who you are, hey, we would appreciate if you take a picture of you holding that mug, maybe out with your bees, wherever, and post it on social media and tag us. Uh, we'd love to see you uh, uh, enjoying your bees, enjoying your favorite beverage in your Beekeeping Today coffee mug. Yeah, that'd be cool. Good idea. Yeah, it'd be fun. And finally, and, and, and our thanks to talk about this quickly this morning, is uh, please, folks, if you get a chance... Uh, make sure if you enjoy the show, subscribe or follow and leave a review. We want to see, we need to add those reviews. It helps other beekeepers find us. It helps uh, us keep on the list at Apple Podcasts or Google or wherever you listen. So please take time to do that. All right, Kim, today we have another great guest, Charlotte Eckert Wiggins. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if you know uh, Charlotte, Jeff. Uh, she wrote a book a, a while back on how to start a bee club, mm. and I did a review of it for the for Bee Culture magazine. And and she approached these uh, some of the issues that can cause real problems in bee clubs, well, any club at all. It's, you know, when you have differences of opinion, you have got strong <laughs> opinions, uh, those sorts of things. How do you handle how do you handle them so that you don't lose a friend or don't lose a club? And she she. Uh, uh, tackled those things very, very reasonably, I thought. Great. I look forward to hearing from her and talking to her here in a moment. But first, a quick word from our friends at Strong Microbials. Hello, beekeepers. Your honeybees face a lot of challenges out there. Unbalanced food sources from monoculture crops, holding yards, drought, food shortages, antibiotics, pesticides, and pathogens like chalk brood. To overcome these challenges, your bees need the multiple bacteria that are in all nectars, pollens, and the environment. These bacteria aid honeybees' digestion and improve your honeybees' response and resilience to pesticides. Now you can help improve your honey colony health with a quick, easy, and safe-to-use product. Strong Microbial's Super DFM Honeybee uses naturally occurring bacteria to restore the healthy gut biome of your honeybees. Check them out today at www.strongmicrobials.com. 
And while you're at the Strong Microbial site, make sure you subscribe to their regular newsletter, The Hive. Hey, everybody, welcome back. Sitting across the Zoom table from us right now is author Charlotte Wiggins. Welcome, Charlotte. Hi, Jeff. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm glad you could make it today, Charlotte. Hi, Kim. Not good to see you again. Well, Charlotte, tell us about yourself. You're a beekeeper in Missouri. Can you just give us some uh, and our listeners a background of who you are and uh, some of your history of bees. Sure. I'm a Missouri transplant. I choose to live in the belly button of the state, a community called Rolla, Missouri, a small college town. Turns out to be a, a, a hub of a beekeeping uh, interest and community. We have 440 people who are members of our local bee club. Wow. And I became involved because I'm a lifelong gardener. And I like to joke that I'm a lazy gardener, but it's more like I'm a practical gardener. And I knew through those days of being a master gardener and gardening that, boy, bees could make my life a little easier if they could pollinate some of the 32 dwarf fruit trees I have in my Missouri limestone hillside garden, where, by the way, my neighbor said nothing would ever grow. And so 2010, and I don't know what prompted me that particular year, I decided I was going to keep bees. And I did what everybody else does, right? I picked up some books. I got confused on YouTube about what I should be doing or shouldn't be doing and uh, found a local club, a regional club run by a commercial honey producer Mm -hmm. and started, got bees from him. And that's how I started. And then two years later, our local extension office contacted me because they knew I was a master gardening beekeeper and said, we have this influx of people who want to beekeep. Could you teach a class for us? And that's how I started the the career in teaching and writing uh, for beekeepers. I basically developed the class and the book for me as a beginning beekeeper. This is what I would have liked to have had when I was starting. And we're talking about your current book that's out now. It just it just was recently released, right? It's called yeah. uh, Beekeeper's Diary. Mm-hmm. Self guide to beekeeping because that's what it is. It walks you through the steps after you decide to you want to be a beekeeper and you've decided maybe you've done some reading and you've taken a class and you're going you've gone home and said okay now what the book is that now what book? I'm a list maker. I don't know about mm-hmm. you. But I can't run my life without my little sticky notes with little things I have to do every day. And so the the diary is that it's a beginning beekeeping book, but it has the information in context to what you have to do. And we've had a number, I've taught beekeeping classes for nine years now. It's frustrating when you go through a nine hour class with somebody and they're texting you at midnight, what kind of equipment do they need to buy? <laughs> now you've gone through that, right? You've, you've gone through that, you've given them books and yet it hasn't sunk in. Well, the diary then has a checklist of your basic equipment that you need to yeah. get. I do like the checklists, checklists that you have in the book. And, and and they are, like you said, laid out very logically in a, in a progressive manner of starting out from the very basics and getting more in-depth into what you're doing. I didn't see in the checklist, though, obtaining permission from your spouse or spousal equivalent before purchasing bees. You're right. (laughs) Although I do have several tips on how to bribe them to get interested (laughs) through the process. So I think that's kind of a balance there. All right. All right. (laughs) Duly noted. Duly noted. Charlotte, I got to, I got to tell you in chapter one, you had, you asked a question. The question you, you asked is why are there so many different answers to beekeeping questions? And your answer was, it depends. Yes. <laughs> the, the most, the most common answer in when teach, I've been teaching beekeeping for 30 years and it's still the most common answer. You hit it on the nail on the head on that one. I, like I said, you had me on chapter one after that. And the other thing, Jeff, that just noted on checklists is you leave a lot of blank space. To, that I can yeah. add stuff to. Not you. Not only are you just telling me what to do, but letting me make a note about what I did and maybe what it what what occurred because of it. Did it work? Did it not work? Um, and I can go back and record keeping is certainly my greatest shortcoming when it comes to keeping bees. And I can see where if you start somebody using a a, a format like this, it could really help. I think corrupting them early is a good strategy because we talk about it. And I do try to keep notes and and records myself. But when I started, I'm not sure I understood why I was keeping those notes. Oh, I'm going to remember where I got those queens or where I got those first two hives. 
four years later, when you've got 15 of them out there, because you're trying, you know, and you're out of woodenware and you don't remember what forms you got where and who's going to get what, what colony that you're sharing. That's when it's a critical or when you're, you're losing your hives and you don't know how old the queens are, you know, that's when the record keeping is critical and you don't have it by then. So I figured if you can start them early, so they start that habit, they'll continue it as they, they successfully keep bees. Well, the other part, the other half of that is if you have good records, you will become more successful. You'll make better yeah. decisions. And it, it's a sort of a self-feeding um, uh, practice so that the more you do, the better you get. The more you do, the better you get. So it's good. It's a good idea. And I'm glad to see that that you were, I think the word you used was corrupting them. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, it's a good thing to do. And, and, and. Um, the other, a, a third part of that, of course, is is that you mentioned four years. Um, I'm thinking four weeks uh, when I do something. And what did I do four weeks ago, Jeff? How good's your memory four weeks ago? There was a four weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, I do. I do want to add on on the record keeping, and I found it really valuable because I'm, and and longtime listeners will get tired of me saying this, but I'm relatively new to the Pacific Northwest as a beekeeper. Uh, I came up through Ohio and Colorado and Pacific Northwest, and I've had my challenges in the Pacific Northwest keeping bees. I've liked going back to my records to figure out, oh, when was this blooming? When did this start blooming? And when did these blooms die? And when, when did everything shut off? And now I've been able to, through my records, being able to say, hey, we're two weeks early this year, or we're not. So and I, so that's really valuable with the log book or record book and, and with the checklist that you provide. You notice that I start out chapter two with what I call feeding bees naturally which is basically a, a, a primer for beekeepers on what they need to have it within the scope of their apiary for, for food for their bees. And I had several people who read the, the draft and said, well, this should, chapter should be at the end. I'm a beekeeper. Why do I need to know anything about flowers? Which, which frankly always stops me in my tracks. <laughs> and I say, you know, your garden is your beekeep, your bees larder, right? That's their food. and so. I put it at the front because I've also mentored people who have a hard time understanding just how many flowers bees need just to supplement themselves for a winter, let alone make extra honey for a beekeeper for whatever reason. And so I wanted people to understand that they're, the, the environment in which they're keeping the bees is pretty critical. You hear now the researchers like Dr. Samuel Ramsey and, and Dr. Kirsten Trainer talking about you keep your bees healthy by what food they eat, right? They can stay strong and they can ward off some of the challenges if they are healthy. And health, just like in people, comes from what they eat. And so mm -hmm. I said, nope, that's chapter two. We're going to go straight into understanding what our bees are eating so that they at least when they're thinking about where to place the apiary, they're considering the food source. Good advice. What to plant and when to plant it and how to take care of it. That was there. That was good. Uh, the, you know, the, the next chapter you had in there uh, on basics, and you were talking about the equipment and the types of hives that people yeah. use. And, you know, just we recently just did a series on hive types. Yes. And, and, and what, you, what you reasoned out was, and I, I hope people will listen to this, is, is start with a Langstroth, only because there's so much more information available on basic biology and timing and all of those things. So as much as top bar hives and long hives and AZ hives are interesting to work with, once you know the fundamentals, you got to learn the fundamentals, and that's a good way to start. Yeah. We Around here, we've had people who get excited about the horizontal hives because of their backs, or they've heard the beekeepers have bad backs, or they don't like the weight. And so they, they're looking for shortcuts or flow hives. You know, we've had several people who have talked about, I'm going to get a flow hive, that way I don't, don't need to know about the bees, I just open the spigot and I get honey. <laughs> and, and we always say in our classes, well, wait a minute, you still have to know what the bees are doing, regardless of where you place them. And the things that they do may depend on what where you place them. But the, 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 the basic biology and understanding 
the life cycle of bees is pretty important to do regardless. And we always say, if you want to do that, do it later. Do it after you've gotten the basics down, and then you can play with it. But when you start playing with it at the beginning and you don't have a baseline to understand what's happening, you're you're just doomed for failure, unfortunately. That's what I was getting to, is mm-hmm. that uh, by starting with Langstroth, just because there's 400 books out there on on keeping bees in Langstroth type equipment as opposed to the other ones, which sometimes are few and far between and hard to find. Right. Better Bee is pleased to sponsor today's episode of Beekeeping Today podcast. For over 40 years, Better Bee has supplied beekeepers across the country with the tools, equipment, and knowledge needed to succeed. Because many Better Bee employees are beekeepers themselves, they understand your needs and challenges and are better prepared to answer your beekeeping questions. From their colorful catalog to their support of beekeeper educational activities, including this podcast, Better Bee truly lives up to their tagline of beekeepers serving beekeepers. See for yourself at betterbee.com. The other thing that that, um, I liked when you were talking about taking care of pests and diseases, and and you talked, you said, you said, you treated each one of them sort of in a formula. You said, what, okay, if you got raw or small hive beetle or wax moth or AFB, any of the things you get, what are you going to see? What can you treat them with? And how do you prevent them? And you treated each one, each one of those diseases the same way. Um, and the formula thing makes a lot of sense. I've never thought about it that way. And that makes a lot of sense because somebody that's new and getting started that's that's okay. What am I looking at? Oh, I know what I'm looking at. How do I treat it? Okay, how do I prevent it next time? Right. Sort of thing. So yeah, that was good. That was good. We also started talking in my classes, and I say we because I have a, a dear friend who's a bee buddy, David Draker, who helps run the clubs and helps me with my classes. And I go to his house and ask his wife, "Can David come out and play? So, you know, so we can go play with bees." <laughs> Uh, in our classes, we talk about you're really managing two bugs now, you know, because when we when we when we differentiate hive management and, and colony management from pests and diseases, people then think they have the option of saying, and they've done this to us. Well, I don't have varroa. I don't see varroa in my hive, so I don't have any. So we've just decided to skip that discussion and say you have them. You have you are managing at least two bugs in the in your colonies and your hives. You're managing honeybees and you're va- va- managing a parasite varroa. Now you may have, in addition to that, at no extra cost, small hive beetles and ants and cockroaches. You know, because people get very excited about seeing the ants when they're just starting at the top of that inner cover. You're 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 managing a series of bugs in this box, and that way. They don't have the option when they're starting to say, well, I don't want Varroa, right? I don't see Varroa, so I don't have Varroa, so I'm not going to manage Varroa. <laughs> and they lose time by thinking that that's even an option. Well, time and time and bees, right? Oh, absolutely. Heartbreaking when you think about all the time and effort that they're putting into this and the enthusiasm they have. And yet that one little glitch, you know, where they think that's optional. So we've it, it, we found that that's been successful by just going straight over that and saying, you have these. Now, how many you have, let's identify how many are in there, you know, yeah. and the, le- the less you have, the better. But you will have some combination of these pests inside your hive. That's a good approach. I like that. Kim, have you done classes lately? Have I done classes? You, I know you've done lectures. Have you been any been doing any classes lately? I haven't been out of my zip code in fourteen months. Oh my! Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, so, I was just no. curious what 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 questions you were hearing. We're we're seeing a transition in questions from people that are in the classes. You know, and I think maybe that shows that people are becoming more aware of the role and the importance of bees in our ecosystem, which I think is a positive thing. Well, part of that, Charlotte, certainly is the fact that 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 beekeeping is expensive. I mean, it's not cheap to get started, and if you lose your bees three times, you're probably going to take up figure skating or some other activity. So, not only are people beginning to teach that varroa is part of the game, not maybe part of the game, but part of the game, but 
people are learning that it's expensive to ignore Varroa. Yes. I joke that it's $700 on a freezer because you're going to have to, at one point or another, put those frames in cold to get rid of whatever's on those that frame. And if you haven't warned your family about that, that's a whole different <laughs> story. But, you know, we you really have to embrace that that's going to be a tool that you're going to be using now if you're a beekeeper. And I've heard, I've heard we have beekeepers who, who have joined us, you know, after being gone 30 years. And they're some of the hardest beekeepers to talk to because it's so different today than when it was when they were keeping bees. And they'll talk about this huge halls of honey and we're celebrating if we have a hundred pounds, you know? So it has changed a lot just in the time that I've been teaching. And then, you know, I don't know about going back 20 or 30 years, but it's a whole new ball game for sure. Well, you're definitely describing my, my experience coming from Ohio and Colorado. I mean, neither of them really bro was well, definitely Ohio of row was not an issue. Our biggest issue is American fowl brood. And we had great halls of honey and, and the same thing with Colorado. And then starting up bees here where Faroa is a big, a big issue. Uh, I knew, I knew they were in uh, Florida at the time, but not in Colorado, uh, at least where I was. And, um, uh, or at least not that I saw at the time, but you know, that was, it was not a management issue. It is a daily factor for me now. I mean, even if I'm just obsessive compulsive and just pull the, the, the bottom screen board to, to see what's what's laying underneath there. It's always a mental note of, did I see a lot of ROA today or not? It's a big management issue. I'd love to have been in the days when all you were working, all you were worried about was wax moths. You know, that would have been, I still wonder sometimes about how those days were because that would have been quite an interesting time and easier, much easier than what we do today. Well, sometime when you've got some time, Charlotte, I'll tell you because okay. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> the the biggest the biggest problem I ever had back then was how heavy is that box, and and everything else came in third. So, anyway, the other thing that I liked about uh, another thing that I liked about um, what you were doing is when you were talking about doing inspections, you had inspection frequently asked questions. Talk about that a little bit because I've never seen anybody do that. Well, I, I mentor, not only do we have classes, but our club is designed to support the students. Yes, if you're a beekeeper, you can come, but our focus is, is helping the students. And when, when we'd go out, I'd go out with a student and start saying, you know, well, what do you see in the hive? What are you, what's on that frame? Or what are you looking for? They would give you this deer in the headlights look. Like right now, we've got people with bees swarming because they think that putting a super on top of the hive gives the queen more room. And I keep saying, uh, where's the queen though? She's not on top, you know, she's down in the brood chamber. The room has to be in the brood chamber. So the idea was to collect the questions that I was asked or, or saw people asking and struggling with doing those hands-on hive inspections and including them in the book so that people understood those concepts as they were reading, because they're pretty common questions that people ask. Both the beginners and the mentors. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. You can, as a mentor, rush, reading through that quickly, I can begin to see that these are the points I need to point out. These are the things I need to point out to people that I take for granted. You know, yes. And, and, and I just don't even think to mention it. Yet it's one of those frequently asked questions. So yeah, it works well. The, the 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 book has actually been reviewed by the Great Plains Master Beekeeping Governing Board. It's a program out of the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And they mentioned I was asked a couple questions about that too. And they liked the idea that the questions are all foundational to the great man to the best management practices, right? They have those as well. We have so many different inputs that people can get that from YouTube, from books that they read, from their friends, from depending on who they're asking, a commercial honey producer is going to give you a different answer than a hobby beekeeper is going to do. So trying to come up with more of a, a baseline of information so that everybody's starting from the same place, that's one of the purposes of, of this book is to give them, so that we're all going into it with the same 
answers so that we can build on the right things. Because so many times when we see students that come to us who are discouraged, they've been doing this for three years and that one, I'm giving it one more time and then I'm you know, throwing in the towel is because they don't have a good foundation to understand what's happening. And so I'm glad that you like that because that was, an, uh, again, I would go back to, at one point, Kim, I had 45 beginning beekeeping books stacked up in my basement next to my desk. At double checking, and your book, by the way, was one of them. Double checking facts, double checking what other people were saying about this to make sure that what I was saying was part of the mainstream. It was not something really off the wall. There's some off the wall things in that book, but <laughs> that's a different story. <laughs> I've got the same stack of books over here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, tell me, you also spent a lot of time talking about honey. Yes. And, 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 Throw out some of the highlights or the, the, the big points that you made because because it, it was just fun to read. I was at the state fair working the booth for the Missouri State Beekeepers Association a couple of years ago, and there was this gentleman walks up with five little boys. Ma'am, would you please tell my nephews and my grandchildren how many bees it takes to make honey? And I'm looking at these little faces and I thought, now I'm going to go up one better. I'm going to tell you how many flowers the bees have to visit to make one pound of honey. And then we got into this discussion about, well, wait a minute, bees visit flowers? Well, what is really honey? You know, it's nectar that flowers produce to basically attract pollinators that then take the pollen and help the plants reproduce. It's a very interactive relationship. I call bees the matchmakers. Listening to these young men completely look at beekeeping and honey from a different perspective was a lot of fun, number one. But the best fun was the grandfather and the uncle who turned around to me and said, so how many bees does it take? <laughs> oh, I said, depends. It depends. There you go. Good. <laughs> yeah. And I'm trying to remember, there were, there were a number of facts in there that I tried I tried to put things in there that people would not necessarily know commonly. I mean, we know every one, one out of every three healthy bites of food we eat, right, are pollinated by bees, but we don't necessarily understand the relationship of honey, which is carbs, right, to bees. I call it flight fuel. Honey is their flight fuel, and it gives them energy. And I also talk about how honey is, is – is, uh, medicinal in some ways you know they dr trainer talks about how you can put honey on scrapes there's a lot of research that proves that that's a really good use of honey i have a friend who has uh, quarter horses and she had an injury in one of their legs and the vet said call a beekeeper get some honey that's the only way you're going to get get that fixed quickly so i try to include some of those from that those facts in in stories in that in that chapter yeah it was fun to read that's good. for sure Jeff, did you get the chance to to take a look at the calendars that are in the back of her book, the first year and second year calendars? Yeah, I was going to comment on the second year calendar because everyone focuses on the first year. And that's, I don't recall ever reading anybody po uh, pointing out the second year calendar and what you should be looking for in that. So I, I was going to ask you about that. What, why did you include that? Well, we call the first year, I call the first year beekeeping the honeymoon year. <laughs> because the bees are small, you know, they're well behaved. You go out maybe with your suit on the first couple of times you're going to check them. You only check them maybe once a month. You know, right? the recommendation is three to four weeks. And by the end of that season, right, Randy Oliver talks about the, the knowledge base of a beekeeper is the highest in their second year, right? Because they've, they've gone through their first year and luckily you haven't had any problems. You haven't seen any varroa. So you're all set. Well, we say to people, wait till your second year, because it's a whole different ballgame. Not only is beekeeping different from year to year, but going from that transitional first melancholy, nice, calm, gentle year to when your bees have established <laughs> themselves and they're saying, this is our home. What are you doing here? Right. So you have a different relationship with your bees in that second year. You're starting earlier. Your first year you start around here, you start April, May when you get your bees, your packages, and maybe your nukes. And then you have basically half a year. And then you tuck them into bed in November and you go, oh, that was easy. Well, your second year, right? You need to be making sure that they've got food through winter. Make sure that they've collected enough honey. And so your second year starts 
a whole six months earlier. And we've had people yeah. who have lost their bees because they waited to go out and look at them until March and April in the second year. So we wanted to make the point that your second year is different. You need to start doing certain things in January. And that's why we have a separate calendar. First year yeah. calendar that says what you're doing, what your bees are doing. And then the second year calendar, which, which then incorporates both of them into the calendar. That's really good. I appreciated that. Oh, good. I'm glad it was helpful. You finished up with disagreements. That was an, in, an, <laughs> in, an interesting way to end, end the book. But, of course, it has to do with Bee Club Basics, How to Start a Bee Club. I'm sure your first book out there. So you drew on that. But uh, it, you put three beekeepers in a room, and pretty soon one of them is going to leave. Right. Because the other two are, are agree on something, and, and the third one doesn't. And there are as many bee clubs as there are because people don't know how to disagree, right? And 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 not get mad. So, uh, finish us off with a little bit about how that works. So, and we've become a social society. I mean, social media based society too, where we. Even though we think we're connected, I think we're, we're, we're more disconnected today than we've ever been because it's one way communication, right? You post something on Facebook. I don't like it. I can zing you and move on. I've not learned anything <laughs> from that exchange. And when you're in club meetings and you have you ask a question, the joke is right. Ask two beekeepers, you get five different answers. Well, and I, I always caution people and say, well, think about that. Why are you getting five different answers? Why do you keep bees? There are at least four reasons to keep bees, right? For pollination, for honey, because you're selling bees. I joke about it for pets. You know, and so the four re different reasons are going to dictate maybe different, uh, not maybe, for sure different approaches to what you're doing. If you're keeping bees for honey, you don't want to be splitting before the flow. You're going to split after the flow, right? So you get your bees, get their honey, and then you split. So that's why you get different answers. So you have to understand when you're talking to somebody, make sure that, that you have your questions, you understand where you are sitting, and you're open to information that may or may not jive with what you saw on YouTube. And then the person giving you the information needs to make sure that they're being clear about how they're expressing the advice, the experience, whatever the information is that they're sharing. And I think if we're more cautious on both sides and we spend more time on listening versus on zinging each other, we'll have better communication. But we've, we've, we've gotten out of the habit of doing that listening side, right? Communication is a two-way street and it takes both talking and listening. That goes beyond B meetings too. Right? Oh, definitely. Yes. Well, that's true. There's a lot of, lot of, lot of new B clubs start up every year because of the disagreements. Well, not only that, but you know, when when somebody tells you something that it doesn't match your your experience level, we have a tendency to just reject it instead of saying, "Oh, well, there's a there's another way to look at that," or "Why is that? Why do you say that that's happening?" You know, what was your experience? If we can learn to listen to each other's experiences, we're going to learn faster, mm -hmm. we will maybe learn new things that we would not have experienced ourselves or, or known that were happening. And we just grow better by having that input of new information. I think we have a tendency to put up walls more now than we used to. And uh, yeah. that's not necessarily healthy for all of us. I think you belong in Congress, Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going to say thank you, but on second thought... <laughs> Well, what have we missed on this? Uh, I, this has been short, but what's the one point that we didn't catch that you think is important? I'm trying to think. I think you made the point. I mean, it is a book that goes with beginning beekeeping classes. We'll, right. We will have mm -hmm. them through Great Plains Master Beekeeping. My class has been my is my master's project for that program. So when you become a certified master beekeeper through Great Plains, you'll be able to get my class, my beginning class, which covers the whole apprentice level. And then you can use the book to supplement that. Well, the book is A Beekeeper's Diary, A Self-Guide to Keeping Bees by Charlotte Ecker Wiggins. It's available, I know it's available on Amazon, probably wherever books are sold. Yes. And and uh, Jeff will have information on where and how and to get it, right, Jeff, on the webpage? You bet. 
just check yeah on on our show notes and then in the web page uh check there and we'll have uh, all those pertinent links okay good charlotte this has been fun thank you and thank you for the you sent me your book and it's signed so i'll, I'll take that one off my big pile and put it on my <laughs> pile. Thank you. <laughs> so thanks a lot charlotte for joining thank you us. jeff appreciate the invitation you bet take Bye. care yeah, I was really happy to have Charlotte on the show. You know, her book is really useful, and I really encourage all beekeepers, first, especially the first-year beekeepers, to use that book as they go out to the yards and, and inspect their bees. Well, first year and second year. She yeah. does. She tackles the second year, which right. which is uh, very uncommon. And, and she looks at the problems. The thing I like about this book um, mostly, well, two things. One is, is that if, if you ask, five beekeepers a question, you'll get seven different answers. But she tells you why you'll get seven answers. People come at beekeeping from different directions. Some are commercial, some are honey production, some are queen production. And you're going you're gonna to tackle problems differently depending on how uh, you and your bees are living together. And the other thing that stands out, it's been my favorite for 20 years in teaching beekeepers is it depends. <laughs> and, and, and it does. It depends. And again, for the same reason, it, you know, if you ask me, how do you do something? Well, it depends. And if, you know, I've do you have a full-size colony? Do you have a nuke? Do you have a brand new queen? Are you requeening? You know, so it depends on how you're going to do something. And those two, you know, along with the lists and the and the blank pages to take notes, all very useful. But driving home the concept of why you'll get different answers because keep, people keep bees differently, uh, I think is the most valuable aspect of that book. Yep, I agree with you. It'll be good. Uh, and I appreciated uh, what she had to say. Yeah, she was fun. And um, um, and her book, what more can you say? It's very useful for a beginning beekeeper, first and second year. Yeah, pick it up. All right, that about wraps it up for this episode. Make sure you go out and check out the Good Food Awards. If you're into honey competition, this would be a great label to add to your jar of honey. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts, wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly on our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of the Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. We also want to thank Strong Microbials for their support of the podcast. Check out their probiotic line at www.strongmicrobials.com. And we want to thank Better Bee for joining us as our latest supporter. Check out all of their fantastic beekeeping supplies at www.betterbee.com. And finally, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else we should mention, Kim? Well, you know, Jeff, we got an anniversary coming up. That's right, we do. And I uh, encourage people to tune into the beginning of our fourth year uh, next week. It's uh, going to be a, it's going to be a good show. I always look forward to that. All right, we'll see you here. 